So today's webcast is going to address thyroid cancer surgery, but with a particular emphasis on voice and nerve monitoring. Before we move on, I'd like to take just a, um, a moment to thank FICA for bringing us this webinar. Many of us are familiar with all the great services that FICA provides. The content on their website at FICA.org, the Yahoo listserv email groups, local support groups, regional workshops, and of course the annual conference. This year, the 16th International Thyroid Cancer Survivors Conference will be September 27th through the 29th in the Philadelphia area. Be sure to make plans. Most recently, these webinars are being sponsored by FICA and can be found on the FICA.org website if you want to rewatch them. So thank you to FICA, but more importantly, thank you to Dr. Randolph for volunteering your time to be here today. Dr. Gregory Randolph is a surgeon at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Thyroid surgery is his main focus, with, with his research focus being that of nerve monitoring. And we certainly, there are many of us in the audience today, I'm sure, who can attest to his expertise and other um, surgeons who have adopted some of his practice and knowledge based on his research. So without anything more, I'd like to say thank you again to Dr. Randolph, and it's a pleasure to present you. Well, thank you very much, Jan, and I, I want to uh, thank uh, FICA uh, for uh, this opportunity. I think this is a wonderful uh, format to share information, and I'm anxious to take questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, the, uh, hopefully, the some of the slides and information will help to elicit other questions uh, during the presentation. And I'm uh, very much thankful for uh, uh, Gary Bloom, uh, whose leadership in FICA has been so strong. And Gary has worked with me very intensely uh, recently about getting all of these slides together and getting these videos formatted so that you could see them. And I'm hoping that this will be very helpful and instructive, and I want to thank especially Gary Bloom, his friendship and his work and his devotion to FICA. So today, as Jan mentioned, I would like to go over uh, the topic of voice uh, and how that can be affected by thyroid cancer and thyroid surgery, and then a little bit also about nerve monitoring. So I'm going to switch to the first slide. The Eye and Ear Infirmary is a hospital. This is the first form of this hospital, uh, which was erected in 1850, and this is uh, basically the subsequent building that was uh, formed is where I work, right next to Mass General. Uh, I also am, uh, work in the Division of uh, Surgical Oncology at Mass General, which is the home, as you may know, to the Ether Dome, which is actually where a Boston dentist applied the first ether anesthesia in North America to a patient actually who was undergoing neck surgery, and this is a picture of the, an artist's representation of that procedure in the ether dome at Mass General. And this is a view from the window uh, uh, looking at the uh, hat shell and the um, uh, 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 Boston uh, River, Charles River, as it, uh, at, as it goes by Mass General and Mass Ionia. I wanted to just take a look back because thyroid surgery can certainly have uh, complications, but we've really come a very, very long way in a short time, and uh, this is one of the first thyroid surgeons, Theodore Billroth, who is a very famous surgeon who uh, uh, lived back in the 1800s, and he performed thyroid surgery. He did many different types of surgery, including thyroid surgery, but you can see that his first series of 20 thyroidectomies, 40% of patients uh, died. Um, so four out of every ten patients, either because of uncontrollable hemorrhage or sepsis, that is uncontrolled infection, uh, died. And this is only as of 1860, so this is really not very long ago. In fact, uh, to show you how, how far we've come, this is a, a pneumatic garment made of leather that allows the patient to be bound to reduce peripheral pooling and to reduce shock in patients undergoing thyroidectomy. This was used in patients who had thyroidectomy. Uh, they were more prone in these early days towards going into shock because they were often operated on not for thyroid cancer, but usually more commonly back then for hyperthyroidism, 
there were no alternate treatments for hyperthyroidism back then, and so many patients underwent surgery to take out their thyroid because of excessive function, and one of the complications of that would be shock, and so this garment was designed in order to reduce that risk during anesthesia for surgery of the thyroid back in the 1800s. So basically, a voice is uh, very important um, uh, to uh, individuals. It's a very personal quality, and so the change, significant change in voice is something that is very important for all our patients, especially those who use their voice professionally uh, on a daily basis. So what is voice? I want to go over these basic points. What is voice? A little bit of the underlying anatomy a little bit of what it means to examine the larynx, and then the SLN, which is the superior laryngeal nerve, which is one of the smaller nerves that affects voice, <clears throat> that can be affected during thyroid surgery, and is uh, sometimes paid less attention to because it's the smaller of the two nerves that affect voice during thyroid surgery. So uh, actually we knew this, there was this relationship between voice and thyroid surgery even back in the second century where they did experiments on animals and found that the, the vocalization of the animal would cease if these nerves were cut. Um, and Gurley, a surgeon in, 17, in 1724, knew that this potential for frightening voice loss and airway problems if the nerves were injured at thyroid surgery, but he also found that if the surgeon knew anatomy, uh, he or she was able to avoid injury to these nerves. And so I'll go a little bit over that. So basically, we've already talked about Dr. Bill Roth and his early problems with uh, death of many of the patients undergoing thyroidectomy. And when uh, his assistant, uh, Dr. Wolfer, looked at his first set of uh, patients, he found very high rates of nerve paralysis, 25% rate of unilateral nerve injuries, that is just on one side, and almost 5% rate of bilateral nerve injuries uh, in Dr. Billroth. So Dr. Billroth had quite a bit of difficulty in his initial set of thyroid, thyroid surgery. Many surgeons uh, felt that, as Dr. Kreil did, who was an early American surgeon, that sometimes these nerves just were not amenable to dissection, that they were so fragile that just normal surgical trauma would render them non-functional. And so Dr. Uh, this is a quote from Dr. Kreil uh, uh, discussing this. And actually this, this philosophy by Kreil has been kind of passed down through the generations so that many older thyroid surgeons have traditionally avoided identification of the nerve, feeling that if they identified the nerve, it would be injured. And now we know that visual identification of the nerve is really essential. The first person to help us understand that need for visual identification of the nerve was Dr. Leahy, who formed the Leahy Clinic, Frank Leahy. And he noted, in distinction from Dr. Kreil, that it is really important to increase the dissection and visualization of the nerve at surgery, and that this would lead to a decrease, not an increase, in nerve injuries. And so now let's talk a little bit of, that's a little bit of the history of thyroid surgery and voice and nerve uh, dissection with thyroid surgery. Let's talk about what voice is. We know that the larynx, which is pictured here with the thyroid, just below it, uh, encircling the trachea. We know the larynx uh, is really a structure that has two functions. The first is respiratory and protection of the airway. And so basically we know that if we swallow something and it goes down the wrong tube, that means it's something that we've eaten or swallowed or drunk that kind of irritates the lower throat and that causes the vocal cords to come together and to uh, close to protect the airway from anything above that could be going down the airway. And so this is the, one of the main functions of the larynx is it forms a kind of sphincter that allows the larynx to close the airway uh, in the setting of irritation. And the secondary function is phonation, that is production of voice. So what actually is voice? If you think about it, voice is, uh, a normal voice is the passage of air 
through from the lungs, exhaled over the vocal cords, out of the larynx, and it is really the, the, the passage of that exhaled air over the partially closed vocal cords that is really to, um, uh, that is really what voice is. And so the vocal cords, through subtle muscular uh, changes, the vocal cords ch modify their shape, modify their length, modify their position under subtle neurologic uh, control. Uh, and all of those subtle changes in shape and length and position of the vocal cord are what give all of the changes and subtle fluctuations in sound that we know of as voice. So vocal cord nerve injury, the nerve, I'll show the anatomy of this, this is the nerve that powers the vocal cord. This nerve is intimately associated with the thyroid and can be affected by thyroid cancers that grow out of the thyroid and can be affected by thyroid surgeons who are dissecting near the nerve as they take out the thyroid. And so if this nerve is injured, as you can see here, the normal uninjured state is the picture on the left of the two vocal cords, these two white bands, the airways between these two white bands. And you can see if the left recurrent laryngeal nerve is cut or injured, then you can see that left vocal cord becomes uh, bowed and misshapen, no longer straight and, um, and immobile. And so uh, the, then you have the picture on your right-hand side of the left vocal cord paralysis. And so basically, this results in that, that closure of the voice box when you are trying to speak with the two vocal cords coming close together and partially closing, that closure no longer is allowed. And so you have this weak air escape sound to the voice. It's really a breathy quality to the voice. And so I want to show you now with this video, we'll go to this video. Um, and this Okay, and now I just want to show you an additional video. So you could see that was the normal situation. A singer looking at the larynx, you see the two vocal cords coming together as she sings. Now I want to show you a picture of a, this is not vocal cord paralysis, but this is a patient who has true hoarseness, not a weakness to the voice, but a breathy quality to the voice. This is a larynx that has affected by a left vocal cord polyp. And you can see that polyp as the patient tries to um, to phony. Again, e. Uh huh. Again, e. And breathe. Great job. One more time. E. And that's just.
Now, uh, this next slide, which is uh, an ex uh, a video which will show you um, vocal cord paralysis. Now, this is a patient who has the characteristic uh, breathy quality to the voice and um, very weak voice, and you'll see a unilateral vocal cord paralysis, and you'll note this cord, this vocal cord is very bowed. It's very atrophic. There are chronic degenerative changes in the muscle because of the nerve injury. E again. Okay, again. Good. Again. Yeah. Hold this in your neck. Again. Okay, good. Okay, so now you've seen now the normal larynx. You've seen a larynx that's affected with a vocal cord pathology, a vocal cord polyp. And now you've seen vocal cord paralysis. And so now we want to go on and talk a little bit about the anatomy. So here's a picture of the neck. Uh, this is a picture where you don't see the neck of the, the skin of the neck and you don't see the jaw, but you see the vessels in the upper chest, the trachea and the larynx on top of the trachea, and the black lines are the nerves that govern innervation of the vocal cords. So these are the, the vagus nerves in the lateral neck that are the thick black lines. And then each vagus nerve goes down into the chest, circles around the appropriate blood vessels, and then goes back up the neck. The smaller, smaller distal branches of the nerve are called the recurrent laryngeal nerves. And these are the ones that you see on either side of the trachea going up from the chest up into the larynx, innervating the larynx. Those are the nerves that we're talking about. The innermost nerves are called the recurrent laryngeal nerves. But that diagram makes it look very simple. Here is a diagram or a drawing that my artist has done showing you some of the complexities. So you can just barely discern the recurrent laryngeal nerve. There's a lot of important structures and a lot of important vessels. That's what the surgeon really sees in the lowest portions of the uh, thyroid region. This picture shows the complexity of this anatomy and shows the anatomy at the level of the lowest portion of the thyroid, uh, inferior pole of the thyroid. And so it's a, it's a complicated area. This is another view of a side view of the larynx with the left portion of the larynx removed so that you can see in the larynx that demonstrates the path of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve and the right recurrent laryngeal nerve and the pathway of these nerves as they enter into the muscle overlying the larynx and distribute these nerve fibers within the larynx. Uh, so how do we look at the larynx? And there are a variety of different assessment tools to look at the larynx to sort out is there vocal cord paralysis or is the functioning normal? And so the first and most useful uh, analysis is highlighted here is the laryngeal exam, the video exam, where we can look with a fiber optic scope at the larynx. Those videos that you saw are just recorded versions of fiber optic exam of the larynx. That can be done with a little telescope that's placed either into the nose or the mouth to look at the larynx. And that's the most typical way the larynx is assessed. Now, let's look at this relationship between laryngeal exam and vocal symptoms briefly. It turns out that subjective voice symptoms and objective laryngeal findings can, can have a very poor relationship. And that's because sometimes you can have variability in the remaining vocal cord function, that there can be paresis, that is, partial function is still left, and so that you may have some improvement in voice if there is some function that is left in the vocal cord and nerve. You can have a variability in the position of the paralyzed cord. If they're very far out lateral, then the breathiness will be very intense. If the vocal cord paralyzed vocal cord is very medial, then the symptoms may well be much less. 
And then there's also variability in the opposite or contralateral vocal cord compensation. And so all of these factors uh, give very variable symptoms in the setting of vocal cord paralysis. Some patients can be very breathy and have a difficult problem swallowing. Other patients may notice those changes, but those changes may improve substantially over time because of these factors, one through three. And so long-term symptoms may be virtually absent in a patient with vocal cord paralysis. And we have some studies that I won't go over with too much detail, but just to show, this slide shows a number of studies that show that voice symptoms can occur after thyroidectomy and may not be indicative of vocal cord paralysis. And these studies show that vocal cord paralysis may be present without voice symptoms, at least long term after surgery with vocal cord paralysis the symptoms can substantially improve. So we really need to look at the exam of the larynx called the glottic exam. We really need to look at the exa uh, exam of the larynx to really sort out if a given patient does have vocal cord paralysis or not. This is a picture I just wanted to show you. The picture on the left is the white area is the trachea. The irregular roundish tissue is the invasive thyroid cancer and that little whitish band uh, at the lower margin of the picture is a picture of the nerve entering into and being invaded by the mass. And the, uh, this nerve and cancer was removed and the picture, the smaller inset picture is the picture of the nerve that is that linear pale purple profile and the surrounding uh, tissue, the darker purple, is the invasive cancer that was invading into the nerve. So that's an example of how cancers can affect the nerve because the nerve is so close to the thyroid gland, the nerve can be invaded by thyroid cancers. And this is a study that we published some time ago showing, looking at invasive thyroid cancer and the importance of the laryngeal exam prior to surgery that in group one, which is a group of patients who had invasive thyroid cancers, 71% presented with vocal cord paralysis whereas patients with a non-invasive thyroid disease only had a very small rate of vocal cord paralysis. So invasion of the thyroid cancer outside of the thyroid gland, a very common event when that occurs is the presence of vocal cord paralysis. And it turns out that to identify whether vocal cord paralysis has occurred or not, you really need to look at the vocal cord uh, exam. You need to look at the larynx that you can't judge um, uh, based on uh, symptoms. You can't judge based on a CT scan. You really have to look at the vocal cord paralysis and identify it on laryngeal exam uh, to determine whether the vocal cord is in fact paralyzed or not. And so again the importance of getting this information prior to surgery is that T4 or invasive stage thyroid cancer is identified by preoperative identification of vocal cord paralysis. It's important for the surgeon to know if there's invasive thyroid cancer prior to surgery because we know that affects the prognosis, it increases the risk of regional recurrence, and it's also a marker for the likelihood of regional nodal disease. So that identification of invasive disease, identification of T4 disease is very important for the surgeon to do prior to surgery. And so that's why the vocal cord exam, looking at the larynx prior to surgery, is so important. So we think that all patients undergoing thyroid and parathyroid surgery should have both pre-op and post-op laryngeal exam. And the reasons for these are listed here in this slide. Prior to surgery preoperatively, we know that vocal cord paralysis can be asymptomatic. It helps in the recognition of invasive disease. It helps you manage the nerve that is found to be invaded if you know the functioning of the nerve, the status of the functional status of the nerve. And it provides a baseline for postoperative exam. And then postoperative laryngeal exam is important because that's really the only accurate measure of whether the nerve has been injured or not. And uh, it gives us very important information about um, safety of swallowing and uh, certainly for contralateral surgery it's important 
before that would ever be contemplated that we know that the first side has not been injured at surgery. It turns out, though, that the rates of looking at the larynx before and after surgery are really very, very low. In Europe, we have two studies where postoperative laryngeal exam was only done in anywhere from 20 to 45 percent of patients, and so we know that this is really uh, a lower than ideal. We know that if we have a routine exam of the larynx, that the rate of vocal cord paralysis is doubled than if we just look at patients who are symptomatic postoperatively. So routine exam of all patients postoperatively will help us identify the true rate of nerve paralysis. And so we are getting some new organizations. Uh, the British, this is the British Association of Endocrine and Thyroid Surgery are now making some recommendations as to routine exam of the larynx before and after surgery. We know that there are many factors that are involved in voice. Uh, after thyroid surgery, and so certainly these two factors, recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and superior laryngeal nerve injury, um, are important in voice postoperatively, but there are many other factors that can affect voice. You can have injury to the cricothyroid muscle, which is one of the muscles on the outside of the larynx that I'll show you a picture of in just a moment. This can be uh, uh, damaged at surgery and can affect voice. You can just have regional soft tissue changes from surgery that can affect voice, usually transiently. You can have the tube that is used for intubation uh, result in laryngeal injury, and that can affect voice. And then you can also have voice change just from other things that are unrelated to surgery that may just be happening around the time of surgery. For example, upper respiratory tract infections and viral uh, infections can affect voice and that also can occur at the, around the time of surgery. So then I wanted to focus now on the superior laryngeal nerve, and this is the um, smaller uh, nerve that affects voice. Uh, this is a picture of the back of the larynx, and this shows that there are connections between the superior laryngeal nerve, which is the nerve that goes to the larynx, comes from above downward, and the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is the nerve that we discussed previously, which comes from below up to the larynx. So there actually are two nerves that interconnect, both of which relate to vocal cord function and voice. The recurrent laryngeal nerve, the one we had discussed previously, is the major nerve that regulates vocal cord function, but this external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, that twig of the nerve, the superior laryngeal nerve that comes from above downward also has very substantial effects on voice, especially this superior laryngeal nerve is especially important in singers. And so, uh, in fact, this external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve is uh, also termed the nerve of Amaletta galli circe Amaletta galli circe was a uh, opera singer in the 1920s and 30s whose career by report was ruined because she had thyroid surgery. And so this is thought to be that it was perhaps her external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve that was injured. And so we have traditionally termed this nerve that comes from above downward, this smaller nerve, this branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, the nerve of Amaletta galli circe. And so this is what was written uh, in the newspapers after her thyroid surgery that this voice that was so beautiful has now been replaced by a, a ghost, a specter of what it was previously. And so we have now a uh, audio clip that we'll go to uh, that is an audio clip of Amaletta galli circe prior to her thyroid
Okay, so now what I want to do is change gears and go to the next slide and talk just a little bit about what can a surgeon do to avoid injury to some of these nerves. And so uh, one tool to do this is with electrical stimulation of the nerve during surgery. And so this helps us by electrically identifying the nerve, confirming the nerve, and uh, helping to uh, preserve the nerve during surgery. Here's a picture of uh, the area where the thyroid was and that linear structure. The big white structure is the trachea and the linear structure with the little red line down it is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so in some patients, this is very large and easily seen. And, uh, but nerve monitoring is helpful because it is, it isn't so visually apparent in all patients. So this is an example, the same shot, the white is the trachea, and that little whitish band is the nerve. And you can see in this patient, the nerve is much smaller caliber and much less evident visually. And so to be able to electrically stimulate this nerve and identify it as nerve, identify the tissue next to it as not nerve, can be very helpful. And so I just want to talk a little bit, that's those yellow hours show the nerve, and you can see how thin and inapparent it is visually. So a couple of different individual points is that thyroid surgery in the US is done really by a range of individuals. And these studies show that much, most, in fact, thyroid surgery is not done by people who primarily focus on thyroid surgery. So we have two different studies that are outlined here. And the bottom line is, in, in that second study, we, we see that 50% of patients undergoing thyroid surgery have it done by surgeons who do five or less thyroid surgeries a year. And so we have to keep in mind that all of those variability of that nerve is in the hands of surgeons who sometimes are doing this very, very infrequently. And so we see that probably because of that, we see that there has been this upswoop in neural monitoring so that right now, at least as of 2009, several years ago, just over half of thyroid surgery was done with neural monitoring. So more and more surgeons are getting the idea that to be able to stimulate the nerve may help them in preservation. It looks like uh, both ENT and general surgeons use nerve monitoring anywhere from about 40 to 45 percent as of these studies several years ago. A more recent study looking at the use in head and neck surgeons suggests it's up to 65 percent. So again, it's increasing. The majority use this, but not all surgeons do. It looks like, interestingly, one of the factors that is associated with use of nerve monitoring is those surgeons who have high volume thyroid practices tend to use nerve monitoring. And in this study, they found that surgeons with over 100 cases per year, which is generally considered reasonably high volume, end up using nerve monitoring more frequently. So how can nerve monitoring be helpful? And I'm going to just outline these three modes of how it may be helpful. The first is it can identify the nerve before you can see it. And so this is an example of the trachea in the midline. The left thyroid lobe has been preliminarily dissected and is retracted superiorly. And this yellow box then is that paratracheal region where the nerve uh, runs through. And initially, you don't see it. It's covered by tissue. So with nerve monitoring, we can stimulate and get positive stimulation in this linear path and then get negative stimulations away from the nerve and then direct our dissection directly towards the nerve to identify it in a direct and efficient way. So that's kind of a way of neurally mapping the nerve and identifying where it is before it is searched for visually. The nerve can also, uh, the nerve monitoring can also be used as an aid in dissection. And so this is once the nerve is identified, nerve monitoring can be used to identify the nerve, which is indicated by those black lines, and then identify that exactly where the nerve is and exactly where the nerve isn't. And then that allows us to adequately take care of all of the thyroid surgery uh, and take all of that thyroid tissue out 
aggressively knowing exactly where the nerve is and where we can safely dissect that thyroid tissue. You can see how close thyroid tissue comes to the nerve because the thyroid tissue is outlined in white and the nerve is outlined in black. So they're very close to each other and nerve monitoring can get you a very good accurate understanding of nerve location to facilitate that dissection. I'm just going to skip through this. This just shows that there are a number of areas of the thyroid that can be left despite the surgeon doing what they think is a total thyroidectomy. And one of the areas, the last area that you see on the right, is this infiltration of thyroid tissue at this um, area where the thyroid is attached to the airway called the ligament of Berry. And that's where that thyroid tissue comes very close to the nerve. That last picture I showed you was a demonstration of that specific area uh, showing how close thyroid tissue can come to the nerve. And then finally, nerve monitoring can be helpful because of prognosis. And this is uh, one of my final points and uh, really shows how important it is to stimulate the nerve at the end of one side of surgery before going to the second side. And so basically, uh, the current way of determining after one side of the thyroid has been removed whether the nerve is functional is by doing a visual exam of the nerve. And we know based on the literature that's available and the Scandinavian Quality Register data that surgeons are not very good at determining whether a nerve has been injured or not. And surgeons really can only detect about one out of every ten nerves that are injured visually. So let's look at, in comparison, electrically testing the nerve at the end of the first surgery, uh, first side of surgery, to determine if it's safe to go to the second side. So we can look at the EMG signal or the response to nerve stimulation at the end of lobectomy, and it turns out that that is an excellent test. The NPV, the negative predictive value, is well over 95% in my series of patients and in a number of other uh, series looking at uh, the prognostic accuracy of electrical stimulation at the end of surgery. And so that basically means that that EMG signal, when it's good at the end of surgery, that the rate of vocal cord paralysis is very close to zero, which is that first bold red arrow at the bottom of the slide. And then we know that when the signal is poor at the end of surgery, when you've lost that electrical conductivity of the nerve, that a majority of those patients would have, will have vocal cord paralysis. So that information is very important and has been uh, written in some international neural monitoring guideline statements uh, which uh, have been published in the laryngoscope in 2011. So the point is that if there is a change in EMG, uh, that is a change in the ability to stimulate that nerve at the end of surgery, you can go back and identify the site of injury and you can also then consider delaying the second side surgery because if you do, this patient demonstrates a tracheotomy in place, if you go to the second side and injure the second side, then you have injury on both nerves which can lead to both vocal cords falling together in the midline and obstructing the airway and leading to tracheotomy. So again, nerve injury on one side leads to voice and swallowing issues. Nerve injury on both sides leads to tracheotomy. And so knowing that the first side is injured before you go to the second is very important. I'm going to just skip over this next set of slides which just looks at a, a different type of monitoring and then just uh, finish my talk and be able to answer questions. We have just about the time that we wanted to to be able to answer questions. We have a new textbook that is now out in its second edition, Surgery of the Thyroid and Parathyroid Glands. This is directed towards surgeons, uh, not so much towards patients, but there's a lot of information in there and I can recommend uh, the, all of the images that you saw from today's presentation is from this uh, textbook which has now just been released in this past uh, month. Uh, it is the second edition of this text. We also have a surgical course. Again, this is for surgeons, not the lay public, uh, but it is a surgical course uh, that we hold most uh, every year. Sometimes we give it in alternate years, but in December at Harvard. And then we are also having a very large international course 
a World Congress on Thyroid Cancer in Toronto at the Sheridan Center, July 10th through the 14th in uh, 2013. And so I just want to thank you very much for the time in listening to these presentations, and I would be very happy to go back to Jan and answer questions that uh, individuals have. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Randolph. That was great. So we have some questions. We're going to start off with first some kind of general questions about um, preparing for surgery. So um, are there any over-the-counter medications or dietary supplements that should be stopped before surgery? And yes, if so, think, is there any particular reason? In general, it's good to discuss all of the medicines and supplements that a patient is taking. Generally, I like to stop all uh, medicines that are not absolutely necessary. Sometimes supplements can have ingredients that are really difficult to even clearly identify. Um, and so uh, I think everything that isn't really essential is good to, uh, it helps to clear the slate and make things clearer. Obviously, the most important issues are medicines that are essential for blood pressure or diabetes or other medicines like that need to be continued and that should be discussed with the surgeon and with the preoperative medical unit that is usually obtained prior to surgery. The medicines and how they should be modified around the time of surgery should be discussed well in advance. There are also, an important category of medicines to consider is anticoagulants like Coumadin. And there are a variety of different ways that that medicine can be changed around the time of surgery, and that's very important to discuss with the uh, surgeon and the pre-op uh, medical unit uh, doctors as well. Uh, aspirin is also a medicine that can affect coagulation, and that's another medicine that needs to be discussed with the surgeon and with your primary care physician to determine whether you're a candidate for stopping the aspirin. Most surgeons prefer that aspirin be stopped about 10 days to two weeks prior to surgery, but, but there are circumstances where I have operated on patients who needed to be continued on low-dose, uh, you know, baby aspirin, and I, I do think that that can be done safely, but most surgeons would want to know if you're on aspirin and want to know that well in advance so that they can determine with you and your internist whether or not the aspirin can be safely stopped for a period of time. Thank you. So now at the other end of the surgery, talking about recovery, is there anything in particular that can be done in caring for the voice postoperatively? Well, I think that um, uh, generally I ask patients to not bend or strain strenuously uh, for the first week after surgery. And so it's good to not be too aggressive in shouting or screaming or singing too much during that first week because that, that amounts to, you know, straining, basically. Um, in terms of, you know, you, I think you really need to try and make the best decision you can in terms of the surgeon uh, prior to surgery, and that will, I think, optimize the outcome. Once the surgery is done, um, if the voice is abnormal, then you need to have a frank discussion with your surgeon and keep them posted as to how you feel you are doing, and you need to make sure that they see you within the first several weeks of surgery to evaluate your voice. We just have recently uh, are in the process of publishing some guidelines as to exactly how the voice should be evaluated and exactly when should the larynx be examined to determine whether there's vocal cord paralysis or not. And the recommendation will be published soon, but basically it says that the surgeon should, in conjunction with the patient, reevaluate the patient postoperatively for any voice changes from two weeks to two months after surgery, somewhere in that general time frame. And uh, if the voice is abnormal, then the voice box, the larynx, should be examined. So that initial physical exam of just qualitatively listening to the voice could be that first screen, and if everything seems normal at that point, you wouldn't recommend having uh, be, be scoped 
to have the camera to actually look at the larynx? Yeah, I, I think you're never wrong looking at the larynx because you can have changes that can be asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. So you're never wrong looking at the larynx. In fact, the recommendation of that group that I just told you, this is the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, is making these recommendations that the voice should be assessed postoperatively two weeks to two months after surgery. That In that document, they also describe that if the surgeon is, say, doing a quality study to determine their rates of vocal cord paralysis, then all patients need to be scoped in order to accurately assess that. So that tells you something about the accuracy of just listening to the voice. So the, the answer is yes. In the clinical setting, the voice should be assessed by the patient and the physician at two weeks to two months. If either determine that there is some abnormality, then the larynx should be examined. And if the surgeon wishes to accurately determine, say in a study, their rates of vocal cord paralysis, then you can't just listen to the larynx, to the voice. You have to look at the larynx in all patients. And how does the cough play into this, especially kind of immediately, you know, in the immediate postoperative time period, a couple weeks, a couple well, weeks to months. The cost of? If, if someone has a cough postoperatively, you oh, know, not, oh. not associated with a cold, cold, something that's apparent, but it's related to the surgery. Yeah, I w uh, well, I would say that would be something that would uh, make uh, uh, you, you, if you had a vocal cord paralysis, you would have typically a cough, especially when you drink liquids. So that would be uh, something that I would want to ask about. So if someone had a bad cough after surgery, it, I would want to really ask them very carefully about vocal symptoms. Um, but cough in isolation is not something that you would expect with vocal cord paralysis. With vocal cord paralysis, you'd generally get a change to the voice and perhaps a cough when you were drinking liquids. Those are the typical symptoms. But what you're saying is if you have some atypical laryngeal or airway symptom, that would just make me want to make sure I've looked at the larynx carefully and made sure everything was okay. But the typical symptoms you would expect with vocal cord paralysis would be some alteration in the voice and some coughing when you drink liquids. But as I mentioned, those symptoms can be very variable. That was one of the main points in the presentation. So the, really the default position is if there's ever any question, have the surgeon look at the larynx. Okay, thank you. And so select, you, you mentioned the importance of selecting the surgeon. So can you just tell us a little bit about some effective ways to find a good experienced thyroid surgeon? You talked right. about the numbers, and, but what are questions to ask? Well, the way, I, the way I divide this is into two factors. And um, some of this, uh, you know, there are, there are kind of two domains of information that I think a patient needs to obtain to make the best decision as a thyroid surgeon or for, say, a surgeon for recurrent cancer. And that is the first is information that you can't perfectly obtain. You should endeavor to obtain it, though. And that is, what is their skill level? And so how can you determine that? Well, you can determine the skill level indirectly by asking other doctors, like your primary care doctor, like your endocrinologist, and say, you know, is this a person who has good skill? And they can give you their uh, judgment as to their skill. Their judgment is very limited, though, because they've only seen a relatively small number of patients that this person has operated on, and their outcomes have been good, and then uh, their relationships, they haven't gotten any patient complaints, and so, um, um, so, uh, you can kind of judge, base on these referring physicians' judgment, that gives you some information. But you know, these, these physicians may not have seen some of the problems that this patient had or may not have had enough patients to have a problem yet. And so that's kind of appropriately obtained, but that's not the whole bit of skill assessment. Uh, you can be referred to a surgeon who may have problems. And, and so you have to, uh, uh, that is, 
information you should get but is not sufficient. When you go and see the surgeon, then I think you need really two, two bits of information. And the first is ask the surgeon how much thyroid surgery they do and ask the surgeon what their rate of complications is. The complications you want to be asking about would be nerve paralysis, and the complication you want to be asking out would be parathyroid gland injury, that is the need for calcium supplementation after surgery. Those are two generally recognized good questions to ask. Those are the two main complications with thyroid surgery. So you want to see how much they do and what is their rate of complication. Do they typically know what their rate of complication is? is that well, they that's a very good question, and the answer is no, they don't often. So a surgeon is distanced from his rates of, or her rates of complication because they really need to accurately monitor that. So that's a good question that you need to ask is, do you look at all the patient's larynx after surgery? Do you know the rate of vocal cord paralysis? Do you keep any official record of your rate of parathyroid gland injury, and how do I know your estimates, your global estimates, are in fact accurate? So that's very appropriate information to look at. Have you written a study looking at your rates of complication? Is there some you know, quantifiable information that you have that is verifiable information as to the rates of complication, or is it just your global sense of what your complication rate is? And then the second part, which I think is important, is the patient needs to have a good sense on a person-to-person -person basis, looking in the eyes of the surgeon, that this is someone who I believe as a person, just my gut sense by meeting them as an individual, that this is a good and moral person, that they would take good care of me while I'm under anesthesia. And that's just something that I think the patient is very qualified to do, you should just get a good sense of that patient. And if that surgeon you get along with and you feel they're answering your questions fairly and they look you right in the eye and you get a good sense, then I'd say that is a go. You know, that you, as long as you can get the good referral from the doctors that you work with and get good information from them about their rates of complication and have a good meeting of the minds, then I think you've obtained all of the things that you need to make a good decision. Great. Well, let's say you've made a good decision, but you still have an outcome of some voice problems postoperatively. What, and I have a feeling this is probably a topic for another whole webinar, but what are some of the most effective solutions if a problem does occur? Well, and does the first, speech therapy help? Yeah, the first thing is to make the diagnosis. And so having a low threshold to look at the larynx, if there's any sense of voice abnormality, is the first uh, a, a tool, and then once the diagnosis is made of clear-cut vocal cord paralysis, then there are a couple of things that are useful. One is that, and the discussion with the surgeon, keeping the surgeon involved in these discussions is important, because often the vocal cord paralysis will be temporary, and so sometimes, depending on the surgical findings that the surgeon will know about that in terms of how the surgery went, sometimes simply holding off and not doing anything and just observing the patient for a period of time, if there's a good expectation that the vocal cord function will recover is the best solution. There's nothing wrong with also obtaining during this time voice therapy. Voice therapy you can think of as it's not going to make the nerve come back any sooner, but it's going to make the other vocal cord, the opposite vocal cord, smarter at compensating and improving your voice in the short term. Then there are a variety of surgical interventions. Once we know the vocal cord paralysis is going to be more long-standing, then there are a variety of different surgeries that can be done to improve the voice. Not necessarily to make it normal, but to improve it. And I will just say that those procedures are uh, all, there are two main types of procedures to get the vocal cord paralysis a vocal cord uh, uh, more improved to improve the voice, uh, all of these procedures tend to medialize or bring towards the midline the paralyzed vocal cord. And that basically can be done in one of two major ways. One is you can inject material into the vocal cord 
to move it medially, and that's done with an injection either through the mouth or through the neck skin to move the vocal cord over. It is a surgery, but it is really just an injection and then instilling into the vocal cords some, um, some uh, um, a material to bulk up the vocal cord and move it over. Um, and the other way of moving the vocal cord is with a more formal under anesthesia procedure which involves an incision on the neck where you go into the voice box through a surgical procedure, an open surgical procedure, and implant some material uh, into the voice box to move the vocal cord over. So there are two different ways of doing it. They have pluses and minuses. I won't get too much into it, but they're both procedures designed to move the paralyzed vocal cord over to improve its positioning and improve voice and improve swallowing when a vocal cord paralysis we know is going to be more long-standing. What's a reasonable time to wait to see if the vocal cord, the paralysis, improves on its own? Well, uh, that's a matter of discussion and should be individualized in each individual case. There is some new information suggesting that even in the setting of a vocal cord paralysis that is expected to be temporary, say if the surgeon says, well, I identified it and, and it looked good to me at the end of surgery and I expect it to con come back, um, as opposed to a surgeon who said, I cut the nerve and I know it's not going to come back. You know, so that surgeon should have a sense of how long this injury may be lasting. And so uh, on one hand, it's reasonable to wait out a nerve if you think it's going to come back on its own. On the other hand, there's some new data to suggest that for those vocal cord paralyses that are long-standing, if we identify it and treat it early on, the need for more, uh, for larger open vocal cord surgery may be less. There's something about getting that vocal cord back to the midline earlier rather than later has kind of a normalizing inference on the larynx and you may have better ad adaptation to that vocal cord paralysis if you inject that patient earlier on. So the bottom line is it's all about early identification and early laryngoscopy. That opens up all of your options. Great. Thank you. Well, I think that is about all the time that we have today. Uh, I, I thank you very much for, for presenting the material and for answering questions. And I think um, I'm just looking forward to seeing everybody in Philadelphia in September. Very good. I want to thank you, Jen, and thank again Gary Bloom, and thank you all of the audience for 